is Matt Grubasich. Uh, Matt has been a Rowlett citizen since 2004, I believe. Uh, he's been on our city council since 2017. He is also the uh, director of Parks and Recreation at the city of Garland. Uh, and so is very well qualified to speak on this topic, connecting with nature. Um, Matt, I will turn it over to you if you have any other opening statements about yourself. Otherwise, um, let me know if you have issues with the presentation because I do also have it pulled up. Um, it is totally up to you. Thank you, Connor. And uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for taking some time out of your Saturday to uh, join us here today. I hope you're getting some good information. I have a tremendous amount of information to, to go through. So um, I think Connor did a pretty good job of, of giving me my background, but I will have um, my contact information at the, at the end. And so if you would like to go ask me any questions or find out more about what my background is, I'd be happy to, to help you. But I only have 25 minutes and about three different presentations that I jammed into one to share with you. So we're going to go ahead and get going and, and, and move. So I was asked you to speak today about, you know, what the role green space and nature brings to neighborhoods. Um, and so what I wanted to start with was just some really quick population data. Um, you know, we just got done with the, the, new cen the new census data that is starting to come out. And there's some pretty interesting data that came from that, as I'm sure most of you can guess that are that are I was kicked out again. Yeah, I was kicked out again too. Destroy neighborhood. It happened to us again, Connor. <laughs> You're on. Connor, am I back on? Awesome. We good? You guys hear me now? Okay. Yeah, I think we're good. Sorry, <laughs> Matt. Um, go ahead and give at the last talk. Yeah, it seems Zoom wants us all to uh, enjoy the main room, but we all want to be in the breakout rooms. So. Sounds good. <laughs> go um, ahead and uh, keep keep pushing on. Sounds good. So, uh, wanted to start with some population numbers, and it's like I, I don't think it's probably news to anybody that's on that's listening that that Texas once again. Um, showed the, the highest percentage of growth of, of any state out there. And what's really interesting, though, is that we actually had several, several um, counties that actually lost population uh, over the last 10 years. And, but we see that our major metropolitan areas gained population at a very, very quick rate. And the estimate is by 2050, two out of every three people will live in cities. And this continues to be a trend even here in Texas, where you start looking at the individual uh, counties, five of the top fastest growing counties in Texas in the fastest growing state are right here in the DFW area. So I think where this is going is you need, we need to rethink what we, when we think of neighborhoods, we need to think about what our cities look like, because as we continue to grow and as our population continues to grow, our neighborhoods and our cities are really connected. So as our cities go, so go our neighborhoods. And you look at where these people are coming from and you really start to break down where that population change is coming from. Uh, obviously the biggest uh, net increase that we're seeing is from natural increase. So that's births and things like that. Um, probably you, if I would have asked you this question before showing you your, this slide, you probably would have said, uh, migration is a big one. And though migration does make up a, a little over 20% of our population increase, it's actually decreased uh, over the last 10 years than it did the year before that. And actually one of our bigger growths over the last 10 years has been from our net domestic mi uh, migration. Uh, and you can probably guess, we've probably all seen the license plates in terms of which states we're seeing that, that domestic migration uh, from states like uh, California, New York, Illinois, uh, some of those larger metropolitan areas that have actually decreased in population uh, over the last 10 years where we've seen a huge increase in population. But when you break that down even further and you start looking at, at the, the population pyramid and, and the age of the population that is, that is moving here, you, you start to see some pretty interesting uh, 
millennials and the Generation Zs uh, operate in a different way than our Gen Xers and our baby boomers and, and older generations are doing. And when you look at how they operate and how they function <clears throat> in, a, in a more technological world is they aren't having kids as, as much. And this is a very interesting chart when you look at this and you look at the bottom of the pyramid and you start to see that the indents here. It means that, that our millennials and our Gen Zs aren't repopulating as quickly as, as some of our older generations are. And so when you look at that in terms of what the future for our, our region is, you can start to, to draw some conclusions. But also looking at what millennials and Gen Zs are is they don't, they don't hold the same things. Um, what they want to do is not always what, what the older communities wanted to do. It's not about starting a family and moving and buying a home and, and, and starting a community. A lot of them, if you ask them, they don't want to rent cars in the Uber world that we live in today. Uh, they're more connected. which means that all of this is, is how do we look at neighborhoods and what's our neighborhood of the future going to look like? Because um, we're going to continue to grow. Uh, you can look at what the population projections are uh, through 2050. and You can see uh, the two biggest counties in our region, Dallas and Tarrant, are going to continue to grow. But then our, our uh, counties to the north and even to our south um, are going to grow at an exponential rate. And so, you know, we all have a thought of what our typical neighborhood looks like, but I think what we need to really start paying attention to is what is our neighborhood of the future going to look like and how are our cities of the future going to look and how do we make sure that they're resilient and sustainable. And one of the big issues, one of the big things that we need to consider is that uh, attachment to nature and not losing that attachment to nature and bringing green space and making sure that as we become more dense and as we become more populated that we don't lose that green space. And why is that? Well, we live in a world that is in a major dilemma. We're in what we call a, a nature deficit disorder. And you may have heard that term that was, was coined by Richard Louvre in his book, Last Child in the Woods. But this is, this is a real thing that is now being documented scientifically through lots of different studies. As we become uh, a more technology-centered world, we actually become less connected with the people around us. And that has lasting impacts. So when we look at our youth average eight hours a day on electronic on, a, on electronics, um, teens up to 12 hours, that leads to, to issues like obesity. It leads to things like vitamin D deficiency from just literally not being outside. 50% uh, of our preschoolers have been never taken outside to play by their parents. Uh, denied um, access to nature maybe because they're afraid of it or because they don't have access to it in terms of an equity issue. Uh, we look at ADH uh, disorders that have gone up in our schools uh, and there's become an inherent fear of, of just being outside. And so these are all issues that, that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. I know even in, you know, in, in my house as we we have a, a, a basket where the phones get turned into every night because it becomes an issue. And you can notice when a kid's been on a phone for eight hours a day that their personality changes. And it's not just kids, it's, it's adults too. And we're in a ever so connected world where we hold these things up and they're a great tool, but actually they've had a, a, an adverse effect to us in, in causing us to be unconnected. And, and that's really what the benefits of neighborhoods can be is getting outside and getting to know your neighborhoods and getting to know your community. And when you have communities that are, are built that way and centered that way, they're safer communities, they're more vibrant communities, and that's where people want to live. <clears throat> this, this disengagement with the natural environment just doesn't affect our kids, but we've seen a 44% increase in anxiety disorders across our country. We've seen childhood. We've seen an increase in depression. We've seen a decrease in immune system functionality. And, and I want to focus on health because it's, I think, really, really important, especially in the world we live today coming out of, a, or if you want to say coming out of a, of a pandemic for the last two years, you know, we've never been more in touch with, with health and, and, and what, our, what can um, our immune system and how we can function and how we can better, you know, get ourselves to be able to, to handle things like uh, the flu and, and, and other types of diseases and things that are out there. And what we've also seen is, you know, when you're stuck inside for, for a year, getting outside becomes really, really important. Uh, I know during the midst of that pandemic, I saw more people in my neighborhood and met more people in my neighborhood just because they were outside walking. So how do we transition that into our parks and our neighborhoods as, 
as things get back to a relatively normal uh, where we're busy again and, and more likely not to, to do that. So really of the future are is where do you want to live? Uh, and this is important for economic development. It's important for public health and safety. It's important for education of how we design these design our cities and how we design our neighborhoods of the future uh, of, of how our cities are going to go and how we're going to go as a region. So do you want to sit in the miles and miles of traffic or, or have more green space? Do you want to go shopping in a strip mall that has no greenery? Or are you going to go shopping in an area that has nice landscape and is, is connection to, to nature? What type of parking lots do we want? How are they going to fu function? You know, how do we better utilize landscape in our natural environment so that it works, the landscaping works with the infrastructure and not against it? What type of neighborhood do you want to live in? And these are all rhetorical questions, of course, because I think we all intuitively know where you would rather go, right? We all know where you'd rather go shopping. We all know, we all know what type of city or neighborhood that you would rather live in. But as we build and we continue to expand, we have to look at, at making sure that things don't get value engineered out. And, and when you look at projects that come out, value engineering becomes a four letter word in my opinion, because usually the green space, the landscaping, the, na the nature uh, gets value engineered out for short-term cost uh, recovery gains. And I'm telling you that we don't, that, that can't happen anymore because it's costing us uh, in the long run, when you, when you look at health expenditure costs in, in our country, um, they're quite exorbitant. We spend more uh, in this country on health care than we do on national defense, and that's pretty insane. We spend more per person than any other uh, country in the world. On average, health care expenditures per person are almost $8,500 a year. And if you look at that in connection in terms of what the average U.S. spends on parks, which is $83 on an average, but in Texas and, and, and even in the DFW area, that average is actually closer to $47 per person. So you can see that we're talking 100 more times uh, spending that we do to, to treat a lot of these issues that are out there that research is starting to show that just a healthy dose of green um, can actually go a long ways in being able to, to mitigate a lot of those health issues that we have. We've, we've literally built ourselves into a health um, emergency in this country in terms of how our cities have been built. And we have a real opportunity as, as we continue to grow to make sure that we're building neighborhoods and cities that bring nature back into it to make sure that they're, they're, they're healthy and that we can have um, good connectivity and, 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 and healthy um, people as we continue to grow. So estimated return for urban greening uh, is just some real quick stats that in terms of reduced cardiovascular disease, reduce, reduction of ADHD, uh, newborn health uh, and from, from air pollution and things like that go down when you have excess greening. But it really goes beyond this is that as you increase green, you decrease health effects. And so what that means is, is, and what it shows is by people that just sit around, that have access to nature, actually your bodies produce serotonin. And that serotonin is part of what can not only give you a sense of well-being and health, but also has a, a physical um, effect on our bodies by making us healthy. Uh, if you've ever heard of the word Shinrin Yoku, it's actually a Japanese practice of called forest bathing. Uh, and it's actually in parts of Asia, it's, it's actually um, prescribed to help reduce uh, anxiety, to help uh, reduce um, stress, uh, where you actually are prescribed to go walk around in nature for a little while. Because what we see is we, as we increase tree canopy cover, as we increase um, exposure to nature in our communities, what we see is increasing uh, property values in our neighborhoods. Uh, we see uh, an increased protection from um, things like uh, flooding, which I'll go into a little bit more. We see a decrease in the urban heat island effect in terms of cooling effects. Uh, cities that have tree canopy cover that are over 30% actually uh, can be as much as 15 degrees cooler than, than areas that have uh, tree canopy cover less than 30%. Um, you combine that then with energy savings costs uh, the numbers really go up pretty quickly. 
you see reduced stress levels, you see reduced obesity because people are more prone to get outside, uh, you see reduced stress. Because people don't realize is that, you know, just like our bodies need rest, our, our brains uh, need rest as well. And when we live in a world where, where it's a 24 hour news cycle and you, you're on your phone and, and all of the time, your brain never actually gets a chance to, to relax and to, to recover. And actually Harvard has done a, a study that, that just talks about focusing on the unfocused. And it's about mental health and about how we need to be able to give our brains um, a break during the day uh, and what the benefits that are. And by just going outside and spending time in nature, it lets that part of your brain actually rest. And by doing that, the, the mental benefits that come from it and an increasing um, time of, of mental stress is really, really important. And it's really important to how we build um, healthy neighborhoods and, and healthy communities as we move forward. There's a, a really great study um, that was done by Robert Ulrich, and you, a lot of you may have heard about, where they actually did a study with hospital patients, and, and they took um, patients recovering from surgery, and they put one, some in a room that overlooked a parking lot, and some in a room that overlooked um, green space. And what they found was that those pa patients that recovered in the rooms overlooking green space actually recovered uh, quicker, they had less post-operative problems, and they used less medication. Um, this has become such a, a trend that they've even expanded that, that research and show that um, it, it can even be just a, a, a picture of nature. And so this has really been indoctrinated in terms of, of how hospitals are built and how recovering rooms are built and, and green space that and the landscaping that goes in and around hospitals and the, the, the core that goes into rooms because uh, you know, hospitals are about making money too. And so if they can get patients in and, and get them better quicker and use less medication to it, then, you know, they can treat more people. And so, you know, these types of scientific researches are starting to have and how are, are we treat people uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So I wanted to touch really, I also wanted to touch pretty quickly on green space. So we, we talked about um, the health benefits and, and why we want to, to bring more nature into our communities, but we also, uh, and we look at how we look at cities with our population growth. And, and another thing that we really need to make sure we look at is we look at infrastructure. As we continue to grow, and especially with the, the new um, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure package that just came through um, Congress with a lot of money that's going to be going towards our infrastructure uh, in the future. And when you look at our infrastructure as a whole nationwide, um, that really is performing pretty poorly. When you look at what our infrastructure needs are across the U.S., um, rated by the American Society of Civil Engineers, you know, there's about three three point six trillion dollars that is needed to bring our infrastructure up to up to par. And so we can look at this as two different ways. You know, you can look at it as yes, it's a a, a problem that we have to do, but it can also be looked at as an opportunity. And so if we as we are rebuilding our infrastructure and as we build new infrastructure, as we continue to grow, as, as we all will continue to grow when you look at the population numbers, it's very, very important that we don't, again, value engineer out those natural abilities to be able to increase and improve our infrastructure within our cities. Um, and again, it's, it's really easy for, for us to be able to, to value engineer those out, but there's some really great examples out there of how this stuff can be used. So. By increasing, impervious, uh, by increasing pervious areas through our uh, right-of-way systems and our roads as those are being redone, as we look at how we utilize green space in our neighborhoods, uh, as we look at using infrastructure in our streets to be able to handle and maintain stormwater and use it as an economic development tool, um, the, the results can be, can be pretty astounding um, for the results that we can get for it. And so just a, a couple of really kind of quick stories. If you've never been to Bagby Street in Houston, um, this is a prime example of how you can use um, infrastructure as stormwater management. So they collect almost 350 million gallons of stormwater uh, through the engineering that was done when they re redid this street. And what they found was a reinvestment of $55 million along this corridor, uh, a 22% increase in le lease rates. And it was also 
the only street uh, in this sector of town and near downtown Houston uh, that didn't flood during Hurricane Harvey, uh, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, Cherry Creek North uh, in Denver saw, saw a 16% in, uh, increase in sales tax. Uh, they more than doubled the rate of increase uh, for both the city and the entire Denver, Denver metro area. Uh, these in major metro areas um, that heavily, heavily invested in, in green. Um, Miami, 85% total increase in assessed value, 1.5 million increase property value in, in uh, uptown streetscape in normal Illinois. And the one that I didn't put on here, which is, a, I think, a really great example is Clyde Warren Park in downtown Dallas. When Clyde Warren Park was first um, proposed, everybody thought they were crazy. Um, and it was a huge investment. It was a lot of money. Nobody thought it would work. Uh, and now when you look at downtown, that's the most expensive real estate. That's where you see the highest rental rates. That's where you see the highest um, rental uh, uh, rental costs for commercial spaces. It's where you've seen the bulk of the growth happen downtown and it's been so successful uh, that now cities all across the country are looking how you put deck parks in so that you can turn what was just space to, to move cars into usable green space. Uh, and they weren't doing it for the environmental factor, they're doing it for the economic factor. Uh, as well as the economic growth benefits. So bringing nature back to our communities is something that needs to be planned and needs to be part of our um, planning process as, as we continue to redevelop and, and build out our cities. Um, and what is kind of a, it's not a new word if you're, you've been in this business, but if you're, you're not in this business, um, Biophilic is something that you're going to see more and more, and it's essentially it's the the effect that that our biology and that nature has on our our physical world and our, our physical being. And, and there's a trend out there now that we call that's called the biophilic cities, and it's how we design cities to be more in tune with nature for the health benefits, the economic benefits, um, the benefits for for our society as a whole. Uh, moving forward. And there's a real push um, by uh, upcoming city planners, landscape architects, um, those that are going to be uh, city leaders, city planners that are going to be making decisions for our cities of the future and our neighborhoods of the future to incorporate biophilic design properties into it for our overall uh, well-being. And so I went over that, I went through a lot of stuff really, really fast because I, I really wanted to show this video and it's a little bit longer than I would normally show um, in, in a, um, a presentation of this time, but it's also a really great video that, that I think kind of um, wraps up very concisely everything that I've been talking about. So I'm gonna go ahead and show it and then we'll open it up for some questions interest in what we were doing here at Serenby. You know, it had gone from this crazy idea of creating a, a village in the woods to, hey, something was going on here. And everyone was wanting to put a tag on. And so I was searching, who are we? And realized that biophilia was really the tag because that connects all living systems. And that's what we're really doing here. And so then we formed the Biophilic Institute, primarily to be a thought leadership group that comes together, especially with a focus on policymakers and educators. And so then talking with Tim Beatley of uh, Biophilic Cities, we decided. So the idea of this is to discuss among those people that are making the difference or have a potential to make a difference as to what they're doing and how it can connect the dots in other cities and other places. I'm an urban planner and I come at things from the point of view of looking at cities. And of course, we're in the midst of this remarkable global transformation and becoming profoundly more urban. And so with Biophilic Cities, what we believe is that nature needs to be at the core, it has to be at the center of design and planning. There are roles for everyone to play in this agenda, and that's what's interesting about the Serendi Conference, um, that we've got architects and designers, but we've got poets and writers, and we've got community activists, we've got citizens, just sort of figuring out what this means to them in daily life or what it means for their neighborhood or their building. So this is a really important meeting for energizing and, and getting inspired and 
and kind of moving the agenda forward. Human beings actually need nature, that it's not just an amenity, that it's actually a necessity. Now I think the challenge is really how to provide that access for everyone. So I think we face a lot of social inequities, we face a lot of racial inequities and social justice issues. You could argue we are a little bit broken today. We are disconnected from the natural environment. Many of us are facing a lot of problems of modern life having to do with obesity, inactivity, diabetes, depression, anxiety, and on and on. And I think you could argue that a lot of those are diseases of the indoors. So I argue that we are living in the middle of the largest mass migration in human history. And it's the migration indoors. And yet we are not discussing it as much as we need to be. I believe it really is the human connection to nature. And what we're interested in is how do those experiences of nature impact people psychologically and physiologically. And and then translate those into the built environment. Through our research of looking at different impacts and different experiences of nature, we developed a series of components or elements that we call pattern language, 14 patterns of biophilic design, that are different ways you can experience nature in the built environment. Some of them are very direct like seeing nature out your window, bringing plants, animals, water inside the building. So those are direct experiences of nature. Indirect experiences of nature are using natural materials, using forms and patterns that you find in nature in furniture and artwork and fabrics and all of that. And then finally, there are different spatial experiences that are really important when we're out in nature that elicit very strong responses. The ability to have a distant view prospect, the ability to be in a place where my back is protected, which is called refuge. The intriguing thing that we're learning about the biophilic responses is that they are not necessarily way faster than conscious thought processing. And so this is where the whole science around what's called affordances and the way the brain responds to spaces and objects occurs. And so translating that into saying, okay, so based on that science, what does that tell us about the spaces we need to be creating to help people? And what we're really looking for is, can I do design that helps lower stress, that improves cognitive function, that improves people's mood, that makes for better well-being in the built environment? I think the point of life, if you look throughout many wisdom traditions and philosophers, has always been to pursue and find a form of happiness. And when you look at the literature on happiness, there, it's not just about feeling good. It's about functioning well and functioning well with a sense of purpose, belonging, that you're contributing things to your community, that you're confident to think and express your ideas and opinions, that you're accepting of yourself, but accepting of others. That version of happiness, I think, is rather rich in some reclaim, because I think when you hear the word happiness or flourishing, you think immediately about the smile and the feeling, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you don't put that together with a life where you have purpose and belonging and contribution, you're not flourishing. And all of our studies show you need that combination, that combination to lead a, a better life. And to prevent mental disorders and other problems. The rewards go to the curious. And nature in biophilia is just the most amazing place that just trains you to sort of be curious. We used to be very connected to nature. We depended upon nature and we still do, but we've forgotten that. And it's why, for instance, in the city of Atlanta, you know, we're so excited to see a renewed focus on how nature is integrated into an urban and suburban environment and why it's so necessary to pay attention to that and to taken on this urban ecological framework analysis. And so the city of Atlanta is saying, you know, this is really important for us. It's, it's part of our DNA and we need to make sure that we embrace that and then figure out how to really value that going forward. We recognize that this is a real opportune moment to really start using this field to create a better environment for all of us.
Atlanta has so many good examples. If you look at the stormwater at Fourth Ward Park above Ponce City Market, that's transitioned to what would have been an underground stormwater to an exposed bioretention, and now it's a public asset. So that's an example on how all cities can really use their stormwater infrastructure as a positive way to connect people to nature. The Beltline is a wonderful example of how just looking at an asset that's been there for years, but abandoned, and that brings it together. The restoration of Proctor Creek now. Catahoochee River, a tremendous opportunity. So if we think about stormwater, how raindrops hit each house and each business, they have to find a route to our local streams and rivers. And if we started thinking about daylighting those areas, we would suddenly have a network of green space throughout our metro areas. So I think our urban cities are just such a rich opportunity because some of that infrastructure is crumbling and we're going to have to redo it. Let's do it in a biophilic manner that really changes people's lives. Life's too short to be creating spaces that impact you poorly psychologically and physiologically, right? It costs the same. So let's create spaces that make people happy and healthy and productive and reduce stress and improve cognitive performance and just make life better. You know, as, as we're moving to a world where 70% of people live in urban areas, this is a really important issue. Here's the thing, we can adapt to so many circumstances. Comforting and joyful yeah. and embracing, but that's not a life worth living in, in my opinion. So I think it's worthy of bringing nature into our urban lives. We have a need for beauty and we're learning actually more and more about the science of awe. Awe is a positive emotion that has been very understudied. And yet we know when we experience something sort of overwhelmingly beautiful, something that stops us in our tracks and surprises us in a way. So I'm fascinated by awe. I think it's something we don't think about very much in our lives, but it turns out that half the time that we experience awe, it comes from the natural world. Back to this real quick. All right. So thank you guys for bearing with me there for that. I'm going to share back to the presentation real quick. Go back to the presentation mode. Oh, shoot. Get to the end. So that was a good synopsis. And so what I think is, is really important and what I really liked about that, that one of the things that really hit home to me with that is a mass migration indoors. And I think she is hundred percent correct. The more we're more and more prone to be inside than we are outside. And, and I think that, that uh, Pascal Mitzura with the Nature Conservancy sums it up best, where the great city of the future is an ecological and economically resilient, and it's made up of healthy, livable neighborhoods where the benefits of nature are available to, to all people. And that we need to, as, as leaders in our communities, uh, make sure that, that we strive to, to include nature uh, in, in everything that we do as well. With that, you know, hopefully we all can 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 live in a should all strive to live in a community and, and to develop a community uh, that is connected to nature. So thank you guys for for your time uh, and be happy to answer any questions. And, and below is both of my emails. So feel free if you want to email me at my Rowlett account or at my City of Garland account. Uh, either way, you'll get a you can get a hold of me. So thank you very much, and I'll answer any questions that you guys have. Awesome, Matt. Thank you so much. Um, that was a great that was a great presentation. I love that. Um, I had a, just a kind of procedural question from Nancy in regards to the name of the video. Nancy, all of the material, including all the presentations, will be available um, on our website um, uh, following the meeting. Uh, so that will certainly be that link. That whole link will be in that uh, there. I do have a question first from Jan. Um, Alexander, uh, it reads, COVID has had such a tremendous effect on our global family. And I can attest that nature helped me throughout. So that's just a great comment from Jan in regards to the uh, the benefits of, of, of 
uh, that natural environment. Um, I've got a question from Scott that reads for suburbs. Uh, does Matt see, Matt, you being the speaker, uh, do you see more benefit in large uh, amenity rich green spaces like Clyde Warren or more to the current model of spreading out resources across dozens of neighborhood parks? Matt, could you speak to that in a little bit of time that we have? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I think it needs to be a little bit of both. Um, and I think as we, we develop, uh, we have a great development in, in Rowlett that really has uh, incorporated green space uh, into their into their development so that front uh, homes are, are facing green space and, and using our, our form based code to be able to do it. And it's you know, the people that live there just just rave about it and the ability to be able to go outside and walk and interact with their neighbors. So I think we need to develop our neighborhoods with that connection to green space. Um, Light Farms Ranch up in Salina is another great example that, it, that has done that. But we also need our large gathering spaces. We need spaces for communities to be able to come together uh, and interact as a whole as well. And that can be where you can really um, have uh, multi-use developments thrive around those types of areas. So uh, we need both. Awesome. Thank you. And I don't see any other follow-up questions. I did have one, perhaps a little bit of a takeaway as well. Um, my, my position with the city is, is from a, uh, a code enforcement somewhat type of role. And Matt, obviously you're one of our councilmen. What is a tool that citizens can have uh, to try and push maybe some of this initiative if there are not individuals in the city or on city council that would have that prerogative? Uh, do you have any advice to individuals that feel passionately in their own communities if they're joining us from different communities other than our own uh, to sort of push that initiative? Yeah. Any advice that you could give to them? You know, my advice to anybody like that is to get involved, you know, find a, a local nonprofit like uh, Keep Rowlett Beautiful or Keep Garland Beautiful or Keep Plano Beautiful. You know, Plano's got some great environmental resources out there as well, as well as Rowlett and Garland. Um, get involved with your neighborhood. Uh, get involved with the city. You know, there's there's ways that you can serve um, like in, on planning and zoning. Uh, get involved when your form-based codes are, are being reviewed, get involved when your city comp plans are being done, because uh, that's when those, that's when those, you know, those are forward-thinking um, programs and plans that are put out by the city that, that drive decision makings long into the future. And so getting involved in, in those types of, of reviews and, and plans when your cities are doing them uh, will go a long ways in, in the decisions that are made later on. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. 